Ernie, uh, good morning to you in Florida, right, Ernie? That's correct. Yeah, it's around uh, 8.30. Uh, today is Tuesday in Mumbai. Mm. There we are. So, uh, as I always <laughs> tell my American friends, American guests, that I deprive them of their uh, breakfast and they deprive me of my lunch. I'm sorry, my dinner. <laughs> but but you get to see the future before we do. Yeah, we do. 11 and a half hours before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweet. So let's, uh, let me do the standard work. Uh, since you are a Toyota guy, 36 years over there. So, uh, I mean, you will kill me if I don't do standard work. So let me do my standard work. So I'll introduce no you and... Uh, Invariably, I get it wrong. So let me see this time I get it right. <laughs> that told you. Yeah. Okay. Here we are. Ernie, uh, Ernie Richardson, uh, you're on the 45th episode of Dr. M's podcast. It's series one. And how I started this series is because of the pandemic. And uh, honestly, uh, I have not... Uh, Wodcaster, what have you? I'm an absolute Gemba guy, and my sensei is Masaki Imai, whom I met in 2000. I've, ever since then, I am into this flow. So I said, uh, I didn't use the word implement. I said, uh, do whatever you want. You do lean. You you can do whatever varieties of lean people have concocted these days. You can do lean six sigma, what have you, <laughs> anything. But how do you support and sustain it? And that was my basic theme, and that's what we are talking about. So. Uh, you're on the uh, 45th uh, episode, and uh, you're putting 36 years uh, in manufacturing human resource management. And so I just tried to uh, put it in a chronological order that you came from IBM, the best I recollect, in 1998, right. and you went to Toyota Motors Manufacturing in Kentucky. Uh, you became a, a, you were there as a production team leader, and uh, in a year's time, you became a group leader uh, in in power train department, and then in 1991, assistant manager in engine assembly. And we go further, and uh, let's see, 1998, uh, the human resource uh, development part of it got attached to you. Oh my God. And you were in charge of skill trades and maintenance development program, and at 2000, uh, the safety department got attached to you, and uh, and I, I like this that you established the world class safety culture and practices for Toyota Motor Manufacturing Kentucky. I have to get that right. Okay, so right. And then uh, two zero six, uh, the medical management got attached to you, and uh, you were the medical director for Toyota Engineering and Manufacturing North America. Uh, I would not be able to pronounce this the other one. Uh, Erlanger? Erlanger, Kentucky. Erlanger. Yeah. yeah. So I was, I was the operations medical director. I'm, I'm not a doctor. So I, I, I rack, uh, run the clinics and set up the programs in the clinics and, and manage the clinics. Hmm. And I'm getting used to this uh, abbreviation like KY and FM. Yeah. Uh, initially, I wouldn't uh, recognize that. And then I got AZ. And they said, what is AZ? Arizona. Okay, fair yeah. enough. I got used to <laughs> so Kentucky. And then uh, you uh, retired at uh, 2013. And that's when you started. Uh, that's 36 years of manufacturing human resource development. And... Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Ernie, for being there and I want to hear a lot about it. I learn and I spread it to the uh, continuous improvement community across the globe. And there's a lot to learn from you. And there's the book that I really enjoyed. And uh, my clients stole it away from me. Ernie <laughs> won't believe it. They have it. They have it. So I'm going to reorder it. And I believe... This is available. Uh, you translated that into Spanish. Am I right? That's, that's correct. And it's available in uh, China and also in India, right? And Polish as well. And Polish as well, right? Yes. That's great. And uh, 
Tracy, of course, is amazing. Uh, initially, uh, I wouldn't, uh, when I saw the A3 diagram that she draws, and she draws it by hand, and then, no, yeah. no, nothing to do with templates, etc. And when Tracy draws it with the hand, uh, then I try to find out where did Tracy start and where did she end? So uh -huh. then I go around and she's, she's incredible. And uh, thanks a lot, uh, Ernie. And uh, you're going to talk to us about uh, leadership culture. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to hand it over to you and uh, we just talk over here on Dr. M's uh, podcast. So I'm going to stop sharing and you can take over, Ernie. Okay, so uh, to kind of clarify the 36 years, I was uh, spent 25 years at Toyota, mm -hmm. and the rest of those years have been since I've been at Toyota, so a total of 36 years. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of go back to the beginning a little bit, because I had no idea what was getting ready to happen when I got hired in 1988. Mm -hmm. uh, I just left IBM and, and moved to Toyota and completely different cultures and I, I, IBM is a great company too I'm not uh, saying anything about IBM but when I came to Toyota it was different mm -hmm. and the thing I thought was different is uh, wait a minute uh, they expect us to work hard every day mm -hmm. okay wow that's a novel idea right work hard every day and it wasn't physically working hard but it was a thinking part of it mm -hmm. and so when I talk about leadership culture Mm -hmm. and, and I've got some I've got nine steps or nine bullet points I'll talk about but mm -hmm. when I talk about leadership culture I'll talk about how to take somebody like me from mm -hmm. from I never built an automobile in my life mm -hmm. and start as a production team leader which is hourly by the way mm -hmm. and my career 25 years later in, in a leadership position as acting medical director for Todd and I have no medical background at all mm -hmm. so you uh what what we always said at toyota is, is as a leader you have to develop people to perform even better than they think they can mm -hmm. so you have to take them down this journey and and, and maximize their performance mm -hmm. and sure is you know and tracy and i talk about this in, in all of our conferences toyota was a company that developed people that just happened to build cars mm -hmm. and I always talk about the true meaning of lean and really the true meaning of lean is continuous development of people mm -hmm. that that kind of feeds into how do we have continuous development of people mm -hmm. and really the roadblocks that we see in the roadblocks that that i've experienced with uh, with other companies since i've left toyota is the leadership are the blockers for for continuous development of people mm -hmm. Leaders actually, when we talk about making a transformation in the company of saying, I want to go lean. And I always ask them, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. I want to be like Toyota. And I said, no, you don't want to be like Toyota. You want to be like your company and be the best you can be. Learning from the aspects of Toyota, but not trying to be Toyota. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about uh, the culture part, then I ask them, what are you willing to change? And the first bullet talk about is be willing to make changes in my own behavior as a leader mm -hmm. most leaders get promoted or get put into positions because they're great firefighters mm -hmm. so it's really difficult for them to make a transition from being a firefighter to a problem solver mm -hmm. problem solver means i have to develop other people to mm -hmm. be able to develop I mean, I'm sorry, develop other people to fix problems at their level. Mm -hmm. We see, uh, for an example, a, a smaller plant, a plant manager is down working on a problem on the floor that a team member should be working on. Mm -hmm. Well, if we do that, we're, we're, give, we're taking away their ability to learn from the problem solving. Mm -hmm. And we do that sometimes because we just don't feel like we have time to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. Let's and firefight it, get back to running, and keep keep rolling. And the problem with it, firefighting is that you can't hire enough people to firefight. Mm -hmm. It'll be mostly hiring people because you'll never have enough. So the leader theirself has to be willing to be able to make changes mm -hmm. in what well. So they have to let me grab my list from up here. They have to be able to be willing to to uh, 
change their behavior in a way that fits the quote culture that we're trying to get to from mm-hmm. coming from. Mm-hmm. And honestly, that is the biggest roadblock that we see in companies. Most companies, or a lot of companies we go to say, hey, uh, I want to be lean. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do anything different as a leader. I'm I'm here because I'm special. Mm-hmm. He's, I'm not questioning that, mm-hmm. but the is of how do you become a leader is to develop people and be able to continue to develop people. So they don't they won't make that transition. They'll say things to us like uh, those people out on the floor they can make change. They need to do five S for an example. Mm-hmm. When I come to your office, do you do five S? Mm-hmm. And and you know what the answer to that is most of the time. Well, I'm I'm kind of higher up in the echelon, so I, I don't really have to do that. But mm-hmm. they need to. And so the first thing that we really look at is is the leader willing to make changes? Mm-hmm. Are they their own behavior mm-hmm. to be a transition for the company? And and it's that's a big. I'll take when I was when I became the manager at Toyota. Mm-hmm. I kind of set myself up for failure because I put everybody in my team just like me. Mm-hmm. Grown up with at Toyota, people I'd you know develop, the people I'd train, and I put them all like me. And we were really not a good management group. Mm-hmm. It really was a really uh, over time it became a real difficult team to have because nobody we never got outside the box. Mm-hmm it became clear to me really quickly that I'd made a big mistake and I need to start being, uh, I need to pick, help pe- pick people that were different than me to be able to push back on, on my thinking. Mm-hmm. Really liked it. You know, uh, uh, at, towards the end of my career, I had a, a couple of folks that worked with me that I worked, that I served and, and as a servant leader. And, you know, they felt comfortable coming up to my desk and saying, that's not a good idea. Mm-hmm. Here's what differently. Mm-hmm. I felt good because I developed them to be able to get to that point mm-hmm. and and be feel comfortable enough to walk up and say, I've got a different idea. Let's try this. Mm-hmm. Big transformation for a leader sometimes. Mm-hmm. And so being willing to change my own behavior become a big part, even within Toyota, mm-hmm. as I went up ranks and got promoted a few times into middle management, it was difficult sometimes to, I wanted to keep doing the same things I've done. And as you go higher in the organization, it's really, you can't do that. You have to develop people at a different level in a different way. So I had to change my behavior mm-hmm. almost at this point in, in, in my career path. Mm-hmm. About for a moment, world-class safety at Toyota. Think about for a moment, a production guy going into safety. Mm-hmm. Uh, and being the leader of Toyota's biggest safety uh, uh, plant, you know, uh, from a perspective, biggest plant in North America. Mm-hmm. And, and and when I went to my leadership and I said, you know, I don't know about this because I'm struggling. Mm-hmm. They came back to me and said, hey, wait a minute, Ernie, you're learning. And understand that we don't need you to be uh an expert in safety, we need you to develop other people to be experts in safety. Mm-hmm. Big, a big transformation. Uh, it was a big transformation for me in my career path, even at Toyota. So I constantly go through talking about behavior changes or something has to happen mm-hmm. in the company. And even, even as time goes on, because of the environmental changes, uh, you know, the, the workforce changes, all these other you can't be uh, this kind of leader today and stay that way for 25 years. That doesn't mm-hmm. work anymore. Mm-hmm. You have to be willing to continue to make changes in my be- in your behavior. So that was a huge learning lesson for me. I have one question for you there. Um, for what I have read, then I want you to share your experience with it. Uh, something that I uh, read and what my sense has said that look uh, when uh, Toyota goes and establishes sites outside they don't take them straight away to Toyota in Japan and say look this is what we do and copy what we do uh, I was told that they make you do the work 
and after you there you have done your work and applied your mind and then probably they take you to toyota in japan i don't know how far that is true what is your experience in that yeah i i would say there's some of both of that is true uh and and uh, if you go back to my experience initially i got hired in in, in may of 1988 i'm sorry in april of 1988 and i went to japan in, in may of 1988 mm -hmm. and one of the reasons i spent a, fir a first month a first month of, si of the first six weeks in japan actually Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons they did that, well, obviously, is the plant wasn't completely built yet. Mm -hmm. And so we wasn't running production at that point in time. So uh, so I went to Japan and and uh, when I went over there, I thought my first reaction was they're just short man manpower over here because they're working us, working our tails off. They're working us really difficult, hard. Mm -hmm. And it took me several years to really figure out why that happened. Mm hmm. It really is probably, it was probably four or five years later when it actually finally clicked for me to understand. And my trainer kept telling me, you'll understand at some point, you'll understand. Mm -hmm. and, and really what that was geared around is it says, I don't want you to ever forget how your team members feel. Mm -hmm. so you go over to Japan and you work in the line and we had to do what called mop one person's process, mm -hmm. but intact time. And as I started doing that, it was really difficult. Mm -hmm. When I came back, I had a whole different perspective. But 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 I'll, I'll touch base on that in a different way. You know, for an example, A3 problem solving. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't start off in 1988 with a with an 11 by 17 sheet of paper mm -hmm. and start, let's do an A3. Mm -hmm. Really started off with, okay, let's do standardization. Mm -hmm. Then let's have KPIs, key process indicators, or getting data. Mm -hmm. Use data to define problems. Mm -hmm. And we will start putting countermeasures in place. Mm -hmm. When the A3 came out several years later, mm -hmm. format changed for us. We'd all, they'd already taught us the steps of the problem solving without even going through the A3 document. Wow. And so the transition from where we were at to doing A3s was fairly easy mm -hmm. because we've been developed in those. So, so when you're thinking about uh, the Japanese culture coming over, when I, when I went over to Japan, you know, I, I thought, you know, uh, this is a really intense workforce mm -hmm. engaged every minute of every day. And I said, well, you know, that's going to be really difficult to bring that back to the U.S. and say, we want everybody engaged every day. Mm -hmm. okay. And what we found was when you come back and as we started developing people and we give them the capability and the authority to make change, mm -hmm. standards, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden keep them engaged. Mm -hmm. Suddenly they control their own work environment. Mm -hmm. all, and it really pays an issue. Obviously, everybody wants to make money. But it's not the biggest issue. It's the issue of being challenged and feeling like I'm contributing. I, I tell people there's one point in my career, I didn't really know early on that I was a part of something special. Mm -hmm. so probably about eight or nine or 10 years into this. And it was so, I was so engaged with what we were doing at the plant. I would have, quote, worked for free. Mm -hmm. That was how engaged I felt. Now, obviously, I wouldn't have. I went to work for no money, but money was not a factor at all in, in my development of Toyota. And so I think uh, I think the big thing that that when you talk about the culture from Japan versus the culture in the U.S., mm -hmm. the big thing is the engagement of people is the same. The development of people is the same. Mm -hmm. What was beautiful about Toyota was as they developed the plant in Kentucky and obviously Indiana and other locations around the U.S., they're actually learning from what we did in Kentucky and taking some of that back and making changes in Japan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Incredibly awesome. And so that, 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 when I started seeing those kind of things, I knew we were with a really uh, awesome company that was willing to make, willing to, you know, change long, long-term standards to be able to make changes for the better for their people. And they continue to learn. Mm -hmm. And Toyota always, you always had this uh, discussion point that's saying the minute you quit learning, 
your value starts going down. So can you repeat that again? Can you repeat that again? And it you quit learning within our company, uh -huh. your value decreasing. Mm -hmm. So that's why if you look at Toyota's strategy with leaders is they rotate leaders frequently mm -hmm. because they always want them to continue to be learning. Mm -hmm. I think I think uh, I think while I was there in 25 years, I was probably in eight different departments. Mm -hmm. About three years of department, something like that. So that's another thing that I think uh, uh, some companies that we visited struggle with the mm -hmm. ability to say, well, well, Dr. M, he does a great job with this process. Well, okay, we'll move him. Oh, no, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. the next thing you know, Dr. M's gone because he's no longer challenged. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, I think that's a huge step from a culture perspective. And, and you always, uh, I've heard this saying multiple times, and I believe it uh, from different people, uh, it's better to train people and lose them than not train them and keep them. Mm, mm, mm. So that's a big, huge statement of saying it's better to train them mm. and lose them, not train them and keep them. Mm. So, did that answer your question? I'm, I want to make sure before yeah. we go in. Yeah, that, that answers uh, my question. Uh, yeah, what I uh, learned from this is uh, well, you uh, that they, they are willing to take the uh, whatever good practices that you evolved in Kentucky and take it back to. Japan too, right? Absolutely. Mm. And across the world. I mean, every plant startup in the U.S. Mm -hmm. has been a little better and a little quicker than the previous one. Mm -hmm. And it's learning from the previous plant and, and being able to develop. And and like, for an example, when new plants start up, they take re some of the best resources mm -hmm. that we have mm -hmm. in Kentucky and Indiana, wherever the, wherever the best resources are, and they take them to that plant to be able to help them get started. Mm -hmm. That's why every startup's a little smoother than the last one. That's why we take what we learn from Kentucky and take it to the other plants. We take what we learn in Indiana, take it to other plants, Mississippi, all the other plants. Mm -hmm. And so when we roll out a new facility, it, it's uh, it's like clockwork almost. And I think that's pretty awesome. There's a there's a lot of planning and a lot of thinking uh, goes into starting up the plant and the locations of the plant. I'm not part of, I never was a part of selecting locations, but there is a strategic uh, mindset about locations, obviously where it is uh, located in the States and different things and close to uh, internet uh, railroad or close to highways. But it's also talking about uh, strategically the people in the area, mm -hmm. you know, it, is it, is it the right workforce to be able to have? And I think uh, Toyota's made great, great decisions in, in where they select locations to be. Hmm. Well, that uh, does answer. I mean, as, as we go along, there are a lot of questions that will come up. No problem. No problem. <laughs> yeah. the, the, sec the second point I'll make in, in, of the nine points is saying be willing to wait for results. So uh, what we talk about uh, is most executives are, 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 they're graded on the results currently. Mm -hmm. And when it's really difficult from a company perspective to get them to talk about lean mm -hmm. or get them to talk about the tools or get them to talk about culture, when it's really building the culture for the future, it's not about building the culture for today. You already have whatever culture you have today. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing today is setting it up for the future. What we, I explained to folks I get to work with now is sitting in the classroom. Somebody else set this up for you. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where you're at today. Now you have the responsibility to set it up for the future. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so when we talk about, measuring the the process or measuring the results mm -hmm. so and, and it, most companies use the kpi the results to tell us what we need to do mm -hmm. the problem mm -hmm. is that's too that's that's too that's too detached mm -hmm. the reality of it is if i can manage the process currently then i don't have to worry about the results mm -hmm. and so when we talk about making money uh, for example companies uh 
can't go in and say, well, we're going to put 5S in place. We're going to put standardization in place. We're going to put A3 problem solving in place. We're going to put Hosh and Connery in place. We're going to put all these tools in place tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The reality of it is it, it's, that's set up for failure mm -hmm. because it takes time to be able to work through all of those. The biggest one being standardization. Mm -hmm. Think about think about standardization and the discipline accountability. I'm going to talk about discipline accountability in a moment. But think about standardization is the foundation to everything. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ono says uh, there'll be no change without a standard. Mm -hmm. Or there'll be no improvement without a standard. Mm -hmm. Because you can't really measure improvement if you don't have a standard to start with. Mm -hmm. Now, how how uh, how open do you think companies are to say, uh, we're going to standardize everything? Not very usually. Because when they look at it and say, well, we, we can't standardize everything because we got to run. Mm. Okay, well, let's back our way into this. How long is it going to take us to develop standardization? Because honestly, I mm. can't measure a process without standards. Mm -hmm. so I can't tell you if a process is stable or not without a standard. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so when we start rolling out these standards, and you know, they'll roll them out. I, I worked with a company recently who, yeah, we, we'll develop standards. So I develop all these standards. They just hang on the wall and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. When I go do my Gimba visit with them, I go to the standard and I say, wait a minute, you're not following this. Standard. Oh, well, we haven't updated. It's been, I say, it's not been updated for the last two or three cycles. I've been here actually. Mm -hmm. And so, and so they do that because they've got a firefight because standards have put pressure on firefighting, right? Mm -hmm. It'll make you get into problem solving. Mm -hmm. And so they do that because they need results today. Mm -hmm. And when you when you're firefighting to get results today, then you don't know what the future is going to be. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, the what we call the process is managing me now because it's telling me what I need to do, mm -hmm. not me managing the process, which is I can tell you what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So the big difference, I'd say, with uh, Toyota and a lot of other companies is uh, if you go to Toyota, you'll see standard uh, process standards at the location, along mm -hmm. with process uh, KPIs, key process indicators at the at the process. Mm -hmm. Rarely we'll see long term company goals at the process because they know if we manage the process, we don't have to worry about that goal. Mm -hmm. And so most most executives that we've worked with, or a lot of executives that we work with, are not willing to wait. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to say, hey, yeah, I'll take, uh, I'm, I'm going to put standardization in place now, which means I'm going to find problems. Mm -hmm. And my problems, I'm going to have to fix those problems, which means I might not have as good efficiency rate tomorrow as I had last week because I was firefighting. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I won't worry about the future because I've got to continue to firefight. But if I fix those problems, then my my operation rate gradually goes up over time and I can sustain it long term. Mm -hmm. And I can it's going to be. So most companies are not, or a lot of companies are not willing to wait for the result. Mm -hmm. To this with executives, but sometimes we get into like the financial side. Well, we can't we can't uh, hire two people and, and wait two years to get a profit return on investment. Mm -hmm. And I know that's an exaggerated term, but but the reality of it is, is you can't afford not to because mm -hmm. this is what's going to add to your long-term profit. It's not going to be firefighting. Mm -hmm. Always coach executives to worry about the process and then we will review the results, but we'll, worry, we'll manage the process to get to the results that we want to be. And sometimes that takes time that they're not willing to, to give at that point. Just give me a magnitude of what time we are talking about. Is it yeah. days, weeks, years? That can be different depending upon where the company is currently. So, for example, if you're if you're a company that's uh, you know 200 people and they've got 100 processes, and we say we got to develop standards for the 100 processes, well, that's going to take a few months, mm -hmm. and then build discipline accountability into that process is going to also take a few months. So you might be talking about six months to a year, a year and a half before they're going to get stable with standardization, mm. Not let alone trying to get to uh, problem solving mm -hmm. because they won't get to that without the standards. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what's unique about standardization is 
it becomes part of the culture. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, as some previous jobs I had prior to Toyota, uh, and, and I'm not specifically talking about IBM, but some previous jobs, we didn't really have standards. We'd just come in and did. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came to Toyota and all of a sudden everything is pretty defined on, on the process side, mm -hmm. I thought, oh, wait a minute. I, I, the first thing I thought, well, this is going to limit my creativity. Mm -hmm. And as I learned going through it, it actually gives us the baseline to be more creative because we have more time, we have more data, we have more capability. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that's a big transformation that that uh, that people struggle with sometimes is how important standardization is. And if you could see around our house, <laughs> excuse me, we have standardization in our house also, like all my tool chest are labeled with everything that's in the tool chest and everything's in my upstairs and in the attic. I've got a, a, a sheet downstairs that says everything that's up there. So when I go up there, I don't have to look through 100 boxes trying to find what I'm looking for. I know exactly which box I'm going for. And I have standardized, so all the boxes in the attic are the exact same. Mm -hmm. They're exactly clear certain type of uh, box. So standardization becomes our friend <clears throat> and, and becomes the foundation. You can't do standardization, honestly. You don't really need to be trying to do anything else. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at 5S, for an example, mm -hmm. 5S is really just kind of saying we want a standard in this area of, of 5s and and if i can't keep a 5s standard good luck trying to keep a process standard mm -hmm. because it won't it won't work so if we go on to the next next uh bullet point we'll talk about be willing to make mistakes so mm -hmm. that means uh trial and error right we don't want to make mistakes that are catastrophic to the business obviously we don't want to make mistakes that put people in risk from a safety or quality perspective Mm -hmm. But willing to be able to try different things to be able to learn from those before I can, can progress on. Mm -hmm. Be willing to, as a leader, be willing to make mistakes on my own, mm -hmm. but I'm willing to allow other people to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. and sometimes is, uh, you know, uh, and, and I'll go back to Mr. Cho, for an example, who was a huge influence on obviously the Kentucky plant, but also Toyota worldwide after he left Kentucky. You know, he would, uh, when he would come and he would see a, a challenge that you have, he would maybe know the answer, but mm -hmm. he wouldn't answer. Mm -hmm. He was asking you questions to be able to get you to come up with the answer on your own. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, we talk about that in the book in a couple of places about how how he would would continually ask you questions to be able to to get that knowledge base in, with you. Because if you come up with it individually, it sticks with you better than me trying to tell you as a leader saying you need to do this, Doctor M. Mm -hmm. Let me explain to you why. Let me ask you questions to be able to do that. So, and, and believe me, I made plenty of mistakes. But every time we make one, we go, okay, why didn't that work? Mm -hmm. I, can remember, uh, I can remember at Toyota when I first, we opened our on-site pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And I remember, man, we had everything planned down to the T. Mm -hmm. We opened the door. First day, we were overwhelmed. We had a line of cars all the way out the road, back up the, the highway. I mean, it was a, it was absolute disaster. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what we did was we everybody got together and said, okay, first of all, what do we need to do temporarily mm -hmm. fix this? And we come up with ideas. So we put those up and we put those in place. And the next day we had a 30 or 40% improvement. The next day is about 40%. In about two weeks, we were we were with the temporary countermeasures. We were maintaining where we thought we'd be. Mm -hmm. But the second part of that was okay. Now let's go back and say we didn't plan this correctly. What did we learn? Mm -hmm. and we we went back and 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 looked at all the data points to come up with the uh, the volume, all this, and and then we come up with where did we miss the mark? Mm -hmm. And so that helped us then develop the longer term countermeasures. Mm -hmm. And obviously part of that was we didn't never anticipate the volume, which was a mistake on our part. Mm -hmm. And 
made that mistake as a team, and we come up with a different uh, strategy as a team. Mm -hmm. And uh, the pharmacist that worked at the clinic was as much involved as I was. Mm -hmm. And so all we involve everybody in the process, right? The administrative staff that I had that was working uh, with me at the time, she was as much involved as anybody was. Mm -hmm. And so we come up with a strategy. Now, I didn't intentionally make that mistake, mm -hmm. but it happened. And so I can tell you uh, multiple times through my career, mistakes that were made that helped us uh, continue on in the future. And, you know, I, I remember uh, even in, when I was in the, the, the medical side, you know, uh, I would I would see a policy or procedure we had on the medical side. And I think, man, that's that's perfect. And then I have a team member call me and, and challenge me on that. It makes me go back. And there's many, many policies and procedures was changed based on team members' feedback to us. Mm -hmm. So mistakes are, we always said mistakes are the first level of learning. Mm -hmm. First level to find an account measure. Mm -hmm. What I hear you saying, Ernie, is you don't go back and tell them that this is my policy or this is the policy. I mean, you don't you don't uh, be that rigid by saying no. There's nothing nothing that we can do. That's a policy. Right. But what I hear you saying is that you take the feedback and you change the policy. Am I right in hearing that? Well, we take the feedback and we investigate the feedback, mm -hmm. and then if if it fits, which many times it did, then we do change the policy. Mm -hmm. And it and it and you know we always try to look at it from perspective of what's the best interest of the team member. Mm -hmm. So we always, when I was in the medical side, it never was about what is the clinical data show. Mm -hmm. It's always about what's the best thing for our team members. Mm -hmm. And when the best thing for our team members is keeping them at work, mm -hmm. being able to keep them into a, a good a capability to earn money and be home with their families and do the things they want to do in life. Mm -hmm. And so, goal was always what's the best interest of the team member and sometimes the team member didn't like that because they they see the short term of hey i want to do this but not the long term of i need to have a career here to mm -hmm. and so, but we did uh, every time we'd get a call uh, we would use that data point to say let's go challenge the process now we got this information let's go challenge the process what does it fit does it not fit and then the second we always had to do with that is if you call me and, and gave me an idea or challenged the process and I went and investigated, I always had to return your phone call to you. Mm -hmm. Me, I would call you up and say, Dr. M, this is what we've done. Mm -hmm. and then you know that uh, that's something that was looked at if no changes were made. But if there was valid changes, we'd definitely make them. And, and fortunately, our team members gave us so much information over some period of time that we made the system much, much better. And, and that's, that's what it's really about. Ernie, uh, <clears throat> just a question for you. I mean, what occurs to me is, where do you get time to challenge the process? Absolutely. Where do you get time? I mean, uh, all, all, I mean, we are so busy doing whatever process is there. Where do you get time to cha challenge the process? Well, it, it, and I'll talk about that a little bit when we get okay. down to discipline accountability. But but here's the thing is, is once you get the standard in place, mm -hmm. then we should dissect the standard to say, where's our weak points in the standard? Mm -hmm. And so as leaders, that's what our responsibilities are. Mm -hmm. is for the process and say, okay, let's do the what if thing here for a second. What if this happens? What do you do? What if this happens? What do you do? What if all these things happen? And the idea being, I can't fix that standard for everything, mm -hmm. but if I can fix, I will. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to say, let's look at the, okay, we put a new medical policy in or our, our return to work policy. Well, let's, let's look at all these people that are out there. Let's look at the people. Return. How does that affect them? Mm -hmm. and, and then challenge that standard to say, well, and I can't tell you how many times uh, literally, it, it, I couldn't even question the number of times when we challenge a process and it ends up in a change in the process, mm -hmm. up in a change in the standard to be able to see the way we want to do it. And 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 that's the beauty of it, right? That's the beauty when you have standards, it gives you the baseline, and then it gives you the opportunity to make changes as, as changes are needed. And, mm -hmm. and, and 
listen to the employees, if you listen to the people, mm-hmm. they give you the right standard for the future. Mm-hmm. They'll be in the position to be able for you to keep the standard to keep up. Mm-hmm. You know, and I always struggle when I when I'm with clients and they tell me that oh, they got this standard and they've had it for 20 years. I'm going, man, I don't know how. So, so you're telling me in 20 years you can't find an improvement in the process. Mm-hmm. And look at the process with go to the gimbal and look at the process with the operator, they're not even doing the standard. Mm-hmm. And I asked them, why didn't you change the standard? And he said, Well, there's no process to change the standard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Those gaps. Are you good now? Sure. <laughs> Okay, uh, the next one is give people space to think. Be willing to allow people space to think. Mm-hmm. Now, Mr. Cho was so good at this in the aspect of, he, like I said earlier, many times he'd have the answer, but he would allow you the time to think about it or ask you questions to be able to come up with it on your own. Mm-hmm. And so that was a, this was a difficult thing for me, a learning point for me in my career at Toyota because – uh, you know, when I, I said when I started in, in powertrain, I started in axle machining or axle assembly and machining. And when I got promoted to manager, I came back to the same area. Mm-hmm. And ironically, I hired all the people. I knew every person mm-hmm. and knew all the processes. Mm-hmm. I could do all the processes. And so it's really difficult because every time somebody would come up with something, I could tell them the answer. Mm-hmm. And so difficult because what I got to seeing was my people are not developing at the level they need to be developing at. Mm-hmm. And because answering all the questions, I'm taking away that opportunity. Mm-hmm. I started having to back away from answering the questions and actually, you know, I would throw it back to them and say, what do you think? Mm-hmm. And so the idea is as a leader, I'm doing two things actually. One, I'm trying to understand what the process or the problem is. Mm-hmm. The second, understanding where their development is in the thinking. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't something that created a quality issue or a safety issue, then mm-hmm. I might, okay, I'll come back tomorrow and let's talk about it again. Mm-hmm. I'll give you the answer. Let's talk about it tomorrow and mm-hmm. continue that to where, you know, and, and you have to, you have to monitor their frustration level with the result, right? Mm-hmm. Just, go for three months and give them that space to think, but you got to continue to ask them questions and have it, have them come up with that in the right amount of time. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, mm-hmm. most leaders want to go down and give them the answer immediately mm-hmm. and challenge them to say, okay, uh, well, we go on a gimbal walk, for an example, with, with a customer sometime and we'll go on a gimbal walk and they'll walk out and say, Let's do this, this, and this, and this, and this. And they just give their whole list of things they come back with from the gimbal walk mm-hmm. of to somebody and say, here, you go do this. And then when I when I do reflection with them, I ask them, what was the purpose for the gimbal walk? Mm-hmm. And they go, well, it's to go to the floor. Mm-hmm. I go, not really. As a leader, the mm-hmm. purpose of the walk is to... Ask questions to understand what the problem is. Mm-hmm. Barriers for other people to solve problems. And I didn't say solve the problem. Break down barriers for other people to solve problems. Mm-hmm. And the third training and development of people that aren't the process and the people that go with you on the gimbal walk. Mm-hmm. No, do you have the responsibility or the right, really, to fix the problem? Mm-hmm. And I did that. I've taken away an awesome learning opportunity for the people that are with me, but also the people at the process. Mm-hmm. You know, I always tell people that if you're going to go down and solve problems, guess when problem solving only occurs? Mm-hmm. When... So it'll only occur when you come down there because everybody be waiting for you to come fix everything. Mm-hmm. And the true world of servant leadership, you're you're robbing them of the opportunity to develop when that happens. Mm-hmm. So if you truly believe you're a servant leader, when you go on the gimbal walk, tell me your value. What did you create? Mm-hmm. My trainer, I, I talk about this in the book too, but my trainer, you know, he came up when I first got promoted into a leadership position, he come up every day before you leave, 
Mm-hmm. We have to have. And you got to tell me three things. Mm-hmm. Who did you today? What did you learn? And how do you know? Mm-hmm. Who did you, what did you learn? And how do you know? And so when it, when I started doing that, when we first started doing it, man, I hated it. I would avoid it every time I could, you know, I, I'd see him, I'd try to sneak out. But over time, that became my motto of, of leadership. Who did I develop? So every day I'd sit and reflect, who did I develop today? Mm-hmm. Today, and how do I know? So how do I develop people and how do I know I learned something? So those are huge. Uh, can we uh, can can you repeat this for me? Because uh, the first uh, thing that was, uh, whom did I develop today? Right. Who did I develop today? The second one was. What did I learn today? What do I learn today? And the third one was. How do I know? How do I know? Okay. So it couldn't be just my opinion. There had to be some factual to it. This is how I developed Doctor M today. This is what I did to develop Doctor M. Mm-hmm. Here's what mm-hmm. I learned today, and here's how I know it. Here's here's the data point or whatever it is I learned. Mm-hmm. And so as I started doing that, uh, it made a transformation in my thinking mechanism to say, okay, every time I go out as a leader, every time I go out to the gimba, or every time I interact with a team member, every time I try to be a servant leader, mm-hmm. I have an opportunity to develop somebody. Mm-hmm. And if I don't take that, then I'm robbing them of that opportunity. Mm-hmm. That's not that's not fair. Because you might be, you could be talking to the next president of the company someday. Mm-hmm. And, and I have a responsibility to help develop that person to become the president of the company. Mm-hmm. You know, like Will James, for an example, our president uh, for many years, a fantastic super guy. He started in facilities. Mm-hmm. And if somebody hadn't developed Will over time, he I'm, I'm, I would think that would be a hard transition to go from facilities to the plant president. Mm-hmm. So, so that that development is huge in the aspect of being able to have uh, continuous learning, mm-hmm. continuous learning, and and it's really difficult. So, think about we talk about continuous learning. It's difficult because sometimes you have to move your best person in the best process to a different process because you got to have continuous learning. Mm. And and again, that's a struggle point for some companies to say, well, I can't I can't move Dr. M right now because he's he's the best we got. Mm. Well, you know, your flexibility depends on you got to have three or four of the best we got in that process. Mm. So if you only have Dr. M and he hits the lottery, you won't have the best you got anymore. So but it's bigger than that in the aspect of the way I keep you engaged is keep you learning. Mm-hmm. And so. That's such a huge, uh, a huge giving people the space to think, giving them opportunity to make mistakes, giving them the opportunity to come up with solutions on their own. And I'll tell you, my experience with that is as time went on at Toyota, uh, when I give people space to think, they would come back with better, better answers than I had. Mm-hmm. I had the generic answer from the beginning. They've got the answer now, mm-hmm. which sometimes are very different. So that was that was a huge transformation for me. So the next one is talking about willing to have discipline accountability. Uh, also a huge one. And 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 at Toyota, we kind of took this for granted because it was part of our culture. Uh, discipline accountability means when we have a standard, we're going to follow the standard. Mm. And you don't have an option not to follow the standard. Mm. And if you do not follow the standard, I'm going to address that in some way. Mm-hmm. I have a process to be able to say, you will address the standard or here's what will happen. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. with accountability is you will, you have the responsibility to follow the standard. Mm-hmm. But it also has an accountability to the leader to say, I have a responsibility to check the standard, which mm-hmm. means, which means uh, periodically I'm going to go to the process, look at the standardized worksheet, Look at the operator and do they do they meet? Mm-hmm. If they're not, then we've got a problem with standards, right? If they do meet, that's good. So now we can build on that. Mm-hmm. And so having the discipline accountability, one from a leader is saying, I gotta be disciplined to go to the process and only look at standards. I've got to be disciplined in the fact that when someone's not following the standard, I'm gonna address that. Mm-hmm. 
have the processes and procedures in place in our company to say standardization is the the baseline for our company. Therefore, when we don't follow it, here's what happens. And so discipline accountability is the standard. <laughs> Wasn't a big deal for us at Toyota, honestly, because the culture was so geared around standardization that it didn't, it was never really a factor. But I can tell you. If you wasn't following the standard and it was observed, someone's going to talk to you. Someone's going to bring you offline and have a set down discussion to say, hey, uh, wait a minute, we got a, we have a standard here. Why are you not following? So what I hear you saying is, uh, just correct me uh, if I heard you right, it is disappointment and accountability, correct? Discipline and accountability. Yeah, so disappointment if somebody is not following the standards? Yeah. And uh, the accountability comes in to ensure that they follow the standard. Yeah, it's it's the the discipline for me to go check it, the okay. discipline for me to 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 go to review it, and the accountability if someone's not following the standard. And an and example of that, for an example, if we ever got a defect, and Toyota does have defects, it gets to customers occasionally. Mm -hmm. Even even uh, you know, we'd always go back to the standard. When the defect gets to the customer, we come all the way back to the standard and say, what broke down in the standard to allow that defect to occur? Mm -hmm. And so then we make a determination, well, the standard should have caught the defect. And then uh, is their operation, the operator not following the standard? So then we go have that discussion with, you know, review and have a discussion with the operator. But think about every time a defect goes out the door, or every time a defect goes beyond your process, and you follow the standard, something's wrong with the standard. But then we have to look at, is something wrong with the standard or something wrong with the operation? Mm -hmm. And then we look at the operation and find, you know, find out that people are not following the standard. Then we'll actually go to the, the leader of that area and say, hey, Dr. M, why are you not seeing that, that Ernie's not following the standard? And then we have this coaching opportunity with the, with the group leader or whatever level it is to say, how are you not, how do you know, how do you not see that? And so, and, and, and there may be, honestly, when we see someone not following the standard, the first person we'll talk to is a supervisor going, why, why are you not seeing this? And then have some discipline accountability, uh, accountability to the supervisor as well, saying it's your responsibility to ensure standards are followed within these processes. And when you don't do that, then that's a problem. That's a problem. And so uh, discipline, accountability, the discipline from a leader to go to the process, the discipline every day, you should be, you should be checking a standard. Every day you should be looking at, at that. When you see, when you see I have to firefight, we should be saying what's wrong with the standards not controlling that. And being able to have that capability to make that transition from firefighting to standardization. And so the discipline to be able to go see, break down barriers for other people to solve problems, and then the accountability when someone is not following the standard, what do we do? Or, if, or accountability if I'm not going to the floor to see what, sh what should happen to me? If I'm not going to look at processes, what should happen to me? And so all the way through the organization, there's discipline accountability to all, all levels. Right. So, Aaron, uh, uh, the mantra that you told me just now is D and A. D is yes. for? Discipline. Discipline and uh, accountability. accountability. Correct? Yes. Yeah, because uh, uh, there was some breakage in the uh, this thing. So I was wondering what D was. <laughs> Discipline and accountability. Because I... <clears throat> I'm sorry, I, I mistook it as disappointment. It is not disappointment, no. it is discipline and accountability, yeah. right? Yeah. So I'm sorry for that because there was a fluctuation oh. probably. Yes, I like that, discipline and accountability. Yes. Yeah. And, and the, the, the discipline also as a leader kind of falls into saying, okay, we're, we're going down this path developing standards. Mm -hmm. The discipline mm -hmm. says that we stay on that path. Even when we hit road bumps, we still stay on this path. You got to be disciplined in being able to look at saying long term what's the benefit. So, the next one we'll talk about is being willing to learn, and we kind of touched on this one a few times. But being willing to learn means that uh, as a leader, 
I shouldn't have all the answers. I should be absorbing as well. Mm. And I can tell you, uh, uh, throughout my career at Toyota, it was very, very uh, frequently that people would come that that I served, that people would come and develop me. And when we got into the medical field, for example, uh, there was a lot of things I didn't know about medical procedures and processes. And uh, and but I was I was, every every single day I was learning, mm. and. And I felt like that was, you know, one of the biggest uh, learning exercises for me at Toyota, along with safety, was the ability to be able to manage an area that you have no expertise in. Mm. And you have no expertise in it, you have to be willing to learn. You have to be Mm. willing to trust also. Trust is so huge, right? I've got people are making the right decisions based upon their experience. Mm-hmm. And then they're teaching me what I need to know. And it was different. I never was, and uh, you know, I never was a, uh, 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 I never got into the medical field of it to say, you know, this, this diagnosis is not right. This one, mm-hmm. you know, that wasn't my process. And, and I never even cared to get into that area, honestly, because I don't have the expertise or the capability to even do that. But I did, uh, I did get into the process pieces, and I can tell you this from uh, an interesting experiment I had with this. Uh, as I was learning, so was our company learning, and we were all learning together because things had changed a little bit in, in, the, in the disability side that, that was pretty huge. But what I thought what was funny is after, after about two years of me being in that area, mm-hmm. uh, for the insurance company uh, that we were with at the time, and I said, you know, I'm struggling with your process because, you know, this is the expectation I have when our team member is off work. I'm struggling with your process. And so I actually spent two days with them and we lined out their whole process on this big whiteboard. Hmm. Started putting discipline accountability to that process. That, okay, a team member needs to be here at X number of days, Y, all the way through the process. And then we labeled them like this is process one, one A, one B, all the way through the last one was. But there was like it was it was a pretty huge process. Mm-hmm. And, and so when we would call the insurance company up, all they would tell us is, well, Dr. M's at five A or five C. And so we could list and know exactly where they're at. And then we could compare that to the time they've been off work and say, based upon the timing, is that where they should be or they not or whatever? And then we'd hold the insurance company. We'd have discussions with them. And they were a fantastic company to work with, by the way. They were were teaching me as well in the the insurance world. But but it's funny because that became kind of their their, uh, selling point for other customers that we have this great process now that... (laughs) worked out better for uh, it worked out great for them but it worked out better for us because we could tell exactly where our team members were and where they should be at that, that point in time and then get into understanding what process broke down to allow them not to be there or, or et cetera et cetera and so I thought that was a really really big uh, turning point for in our medical management side uh, we also touched on this one a little bit too is be willing to act today for the future. I always thought about Mr. Cho when, when I was thinking about this bullet point and Mr. Cho would always, you know, he knew that he wasn't going to be at the plant forever. Mm-hmm. For to be able to get this culture in place, he had to do things today mm-hmm. that would have 5, 10, 15 years from now. Mm-hmm. It was so good at being able to uh, think about the future, not just today and being able to make decisions based upon obviously company goals and objectives, but, also, what do we want to achieve long term? And and I think dynamic, even if you go to the plant in Kentucky today, not many people are still there that actually work with Mr. Cho. Mm-hmm. But I promise you, you can't spend much time there before you'll hear somebody talking about Mr. Cho. Mm-hmm. And so his impact is is far reaching mm-hmm. and but so visionary. And, and actually, it kind of it kind of, after you kind of understood what he was doing, it kind of made you want to be like him. Mm-hmm. Look for the future to stay, say, you know, 
what we do today, how is it going to impact the company of 10, 15, 20 years from now? What how do we make that how do we make that learning? How do we make that and that activity I do today and how are we going to extend that to beyond today's impact to down the road to several years from now? And and you get those opportunities. And I always talk about uh, and and when we're with clients talking about having a Mr. Chobo. And and what I mean by that is having the ability to have an interaction with someone today that makes a difference in their whole career path from this day forward. Mm -hmm. You have that opportunity to make that transition, then then you're not only changing the company, but you're changing the person. Mm -hmm. And and changing the person's what sustains it long term for the company. Mm -hmm. I, I can I, and and again I won't get into the book too much, but in the book we talk about several examples to where uh, I had interactions with leaders at Toyota mm-hmm. that that uh, that that changed me personally. Mm-hmm. Personally, mm-hmm. one of them was talking about how to develop people because you know I was always kind of a doer. I always kind of honestly when I went to work at Toyota I was kind of a, a introvert that kind of like working by myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously that didn't fit well at Toyota. So I had a lot of learning to do. And so it transitioned you from being a, an introvert. And some people are still introverts. I'm still an introvert at heart, mm-hmm. but I have to cast when I need. And so that development happened through people at Toyota though. That wasn't something I self helped on. It was people at Toyota to help me develop that over some period of time. Mm-hmm. So that was that was huge. Uh, talking about the actions we do today to have an impact to the future, and and uh, you know, I always uh, ask the executives of the company, where do, where will this company be in ten years from now? Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty five years. Have what's that vision have that says what is what's it going to look like twenty five years from now? Mm-hmm. That they have to be exactly right, but it has to be thinking that far out. Mm-hmm. And and being able to continually make those changes, and we obviously can't predict things like COVID mm-hmm. and, and different things that were, were outside our scope of control. But there's so much that's within our scope of control. Mm-hmm. We can and have to be able to look forward to to be able to continue to have the impact that we're, we're wanting to have. And it's the leader's responsibility to create the culture for the future. Mm-hmm. It's responsibility to create the culture today. Mm-hmm. But just saying, how what, what's it going to be like several years from now? A, a big two more, and then I'll I'll answer any questions you might have. Uh, be, be as a servant leader, as a, if you're a true servant leader, you never get credit for anything. You're always giving credit to other people. True, putting those people in positions to be successful, not in a position to fail, mm-hmm. and so. You're always taking what you're learning and p- passing it to someone else to, so they can. And we'd always talk about in our world, if you don't have people in your group who can replace you the minute you walk out, then you're probably not developing people correctly. Mm. So you're probably going to struggle ever getting another assignment if there's not somebody behind you that can walk in and take over your position, mm-hmm. which means not developing people uh, you're not giving them the credit you're not giving the recognition that they should have mm-hmm. to be able to continue to you know develop their career path mm-hmm. and part of the future for Toyota uh, you know that people always ask us all the time you know Tracy and I when we're out uh, you all talk like you're still there mm-hmm. and been there since 2013 and I explained to them the culture was I'll always be part of that mm-hmm. from this day forward and I give that credit to the leaders organization and how they have in- included you into making company decisions including you in the right decisions and give me the ability to feel like I want to be part of that mm-hmm. so giving that credit is is part of how do we develop people in the long term right and I, I don't mean false credit. I don't mean, hey, Dr. M, if you're doing a terrible job, I'm not going to come up and tell you, hey, you're doing a great job. Matter of fact, I tried that when I first became a leader. Of I wanted everybody to like me. 
And so therefore I would tell them all these positive things about everything. And even if they sucked at what they did, I would tell them how great they were. And so that didn't get me nowhere. Right. And so I was still struggling. And so I had to back up and I actually talked with my leaders and say, you know, here's something I'm struggling. And that's the other thing I think it's really unique in our world is when you're struggling at something, it's okay to go to your leader or, mm -hmm. or two or three levels up and say, I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of companies I go to, uh, that would be viewed as a negative of, well, you know, you're, you're responsible for X, Dr. M take care of it. Mm -hmm. No, I'm struggling. And so, uh, as, 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 as you get developed and you go tell them I'm struggling, the ability comes back for you to be able to kind of constantly make changes to your, and, and them to be able to help you make that change. Mm -hmm. I think that's so huge. And, and I give credit to my leaders to being able to see that, to be able to help me be able to do that. Uh, I had some of the most uh, uh, top of the line leaders in, in, in the world, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I got the opportunity to work with it. And I didn't agree with them all the time, but that's okay. We could, we could have disagreements, which I thought was, was really, really good. The last one I'll talk to, and this one's the hardest one for leaders. Mm -hmm. Willing to listen. Pardon me? Be willing to listen. Mm -hmm. so, you're, all right. so be willing to listen. And we always talk about uh, listening is an art. Mm -hmm. and, so the listening part, it's talking about, it's, it's not just hearing what they're saying. Mm -hmm. It's saying it. what's their body language. What's all these other aspects of, so don't just take what there's coming out of their mouth, but mm -hmm. being able to everything that's around them to be able to understand when do I need to intervene? When do I not? Mm -hmm. When do I just hear and listen? When does somebody need to vent and have the opportunity, uh, Sometimes the leaders struggle to listen, mm -hmm. not only to listen to what they're saying, but also they struggle to listen to how they're saying it and, and mm -hmm. what's the they're in to be able to say it. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, we always, part of the, as I said earlier, part of who did I develop today? What did I learn? How do I know? Part of that was having to listen, having mm -hmm. to be able to hear what people are saying. So that's how I would. And so uh, it become to say, uh, you know, uh, listening is a skill mm -hmm. that people develop. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when somebody's listening to you uh, or you're listening to them and you, the minute you hear something you don't necessarily agree with, I'm already thinking about my response. I'm not, I quit listening. Mm -hmm. And so we call that uh the ability to be able to listen intently to what the outcome of the person's wanting mm. ability to be able to have that discussion point with them the same. Let me rephrase what I, you just said. And, mm. if I, right? mm. and so it's a lost art. It's really difficult. Uh, and, and, and a lot of our clients really struggle with that. Mm. Uh, even if they do listen, they don't uh, value it. You know what I'm saying? They don't, they don't, <clears throat> that to heart to say uh, Dr. M told me this and so here's what we should look at instead Dr. M told me this let's just go ahead and do whatever we want to and so think about uh, leaders and I'll kind of wrap it up with this is leaders uh, culture is the cultivator that makes everything go they're the fertilizer that makes the plant grow they're the the uh, vision to say, hey, this is what we're going to be in the future. If you've got a really uh, challenging leadership culture, mm -hmm. the future is probably going to be challenging. If you've got a real uh, servant leadership type culture, mm -hmm. uh, look out, man, because the sky's the limit. And so, uh, so leadership culture is much more difficult to change than operational culture or the culture at the floor. <laughs> operators and employees want to do a good job and I believe they come in every day with intent to be able to do a good job mm -hmm. the op, the leaders and organization put the roadblocks up to keep them from being able to do that mm -hmm. but one is not challenging people enough mm -hmm. not challenging them to be able to expand their horizons not challenge them to continue to learn mm -hmm. you know Worst thing we can do to somebody is put them in a job and say, here you are, Dr. M, you're in here for 25 years. Mm -hmm. Oh, my 
my goodness. So after about uh, a few months or maybe a year, it becomes so uh, mundane to you. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult for you to be energized about coming to work. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, you know, when you get to the point where you get on in the car to come to work and you dread it, mm -hmm. you need to me. We need to have a discussion about why you dread it. And I know it's it's work, but but I need you to be able to have continuously to be able to be continuously engaged in, in being in development. So that's kind of the leadership. Uh, culture piece uh, in my nine steps or nine bullet points? Well, I mean, I think on each of them, we can go on because I love what you said and uh, a lot of things, uh, I mean, I'm sure I'm going to ask you to come again <laughs> because there are a lot of question marks in my head and you know one thing what I liked uh, what you uh, spoke today to be very honest, I didn't hear a single Japanese word from you. Yeah. Because I, 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 was, I was saying, when am I going to hear some Japanese word? And you never uttered a single Japanese word. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank no you problem. for that. No problem. I've got a visitor here with me. Hey, <laughs> you're getting recorded. You're getting recorded. I know. <laughs> I'm hey, kind of blurred out. I heard uh, your books are, uh, the book is going to be uh, already translated in uh, Spanish, uh, Chinese, or uh, available in India? Um, it, the Chinese version is, is being, uh, I think, deployed now, and the Indian version is being worked on. And my hope in the future is uh, uh, Spanish, Espanol. So that we hope to allow that to be done we're we're working on it it takes time it does now you know what you helped me to pronounce Ernie's name correctly i heard you four times on your voice more than four times to get Ernie right Let's... Ernie. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, you very much uh, Ernie and uh, tracy uh, so nice of you thank you very much and uh, <laughs> Nice of her to have dropped in. Uh, so I'm going to stop recording. No problem, man.